man. Give it up for the band, if you would. I didn't know I was supposed to bring my overalls and have a piece of straw hanging out of my, out of my mouth. Come on now. Too soon? Too soon? I know. Where's my podium? Where's my podium? Well, well I know. Oh, Davey. Give it up for Davey. You ask, you shall receive. So thank you, my friend. What if I was to uh, invite you all out tomorrow for a race? And I said, bring a bike, and we're going to meet out here at 10 o'clock. And then all of a sudden I said, go! You'd all be like looking at me like, what, what are we supposed to do? Where are we supposed to go? What if we had a competition, a race, where the rules weren't given? You ever heard of anything like this? There is actually a foot race that exists between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. There are no rules and there are no spectators. You just, on foot, you do the best time between L.A. and Las Vegas. And the record right now is 110 hours. But what's really, really interesting about it is they don't care how you do it. You just have to do it on foot. And when you ultimately get to the goal, which is the famous Las Vegas sign, there's no one there to say congratulations. There's a guy who actually did a video, and he goes, it's the most surreal thing to arrive at the goal having done this 500-kilometer journey on foot and just realize no one here cares about what I've just done. Think about it. We would, we would go crazy if sports, whatever sport you want to uh, say is my favorite, got two good soccer games on today, the Copa and the Euro, go England and go Colombia. That's what I'm going to say. But we would all pull our hair out if there were no rules. Right? We'd pull our hair out if there was just like no objective. What we have to realize is we do best knowing what the rules of the game are. Right? And there's no more truer reality of this than when it comes to our spiritual journey, which we could equate to a race. That's the Bible frequently says your walk with God is a race. And not only is it a race, but there's a great cloud of witnesses cheering us on. And there's a finish line that says, when you get there, you're going to have God himself saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Right? But I, th I think we as the church, capital C, so not just us, but any church, does a really bad job of, of telling us kind of what the rules are. Because rules aren't necessarily bad. Rules aren't, aren't bad at all. Because here's what we do well. And I think you would agree with, that, with me. We, we do a great job of getting people maybe to say yes to Jesus. You know, how many of us have been a part of churches where <gasps> they raised their hand? Yay! They walked an aisle. They went to a crusade and, and said yes. But what happens after that? Would you say that's the start of an amazing journey? Yes. Yeah. New life in Christ is a, an amazing start, but that's not all there is. And you know what we tend to be deficient in is in explaining kind of the, the rules for the journey. And that's where we are in Exodus 13. If you have your Bibles, turn there, and I hope you do. Exodus 13 is given to us because the Passover has just happened. Israel has been delivered out of Egypt. They're about ready to enter their journey to the land flowing with milk and honey. But they need to know what's next, right? Have you ever asked yourself as a believer in Christ, okay, I have Jesus, what's next? Well, Exodus 13 is, it's almost like God knew. Like, it's, it's not enough just to be delivered. You have to know not 
only your deliverance. You have to know your destination, and you need to know the details in between. Can I get an amen from, amen from somebody? So we're really good about getting people saved, and we're really good about reminding them of maybe heaven, but what about everything in between? Deliverance is important. Destination is important. But let me just tell you, the details of the journey may be the most important. So look at Exodus 13 with me, if you would. Because here's what I do know about Israel, and I know this is true about our lives. Someone once said, it took one night to get Israel out of Egypt, but it's going to take 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. What, what does that mean? When I, when I say that, what does that mean? Anybody? Open floor. Leave idols behind. Takes a long time, doesn't it? For them to trust God again. Was that? They brought their baggage. Anyone got any baggage here today? That you just know God's saying, drop it. Any old habits that you're just like, when is this thing going to get kicked? Right? All of us are here because we're on a journey, and maybe someone never came alongside of us and said, can I tell you kind of the rules of the game? Can I kind of tell you how you are, 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 are to prepare yourself for the, the land flowing with milk and honey? Yeah, it takes one night for God to save us, but it takes a, a generation for him to get all the stuff that has destroyed us and ruined us out of our lives. You know what that's called? It's called sanctification. Right? Matter of fact, I think we need a good reminder this morning. So let's start with this. Uh, and it's all about remembering. So you're going to see this theme throughout Exodus. It's, a, it's about remembering. You know, we remember, uh, or we should remember a lot when it comes to our spiritual deliverance. This is why we do communion regularly. Because Jesus, did he not say, when you do this, remember what I've done on your behalf. Right? Remember when someone gets baptized, what the baptism symbolizes. So communion symbolizing something. Baptism symbolizing something. And it's all forcing us to remember because we're a forgetful people. So three, four things we're going to talk about this morning about remembering. The first is this. Remember your doctrine. So just, just to make sure we're all on the same page and we're all kind of starting at the same kind of starting gate uh, on this race we call uh, life and, and life in Christ. There's three things that are important to remember when it comes to doctrine. And these are things that I've taught before. If you've heard them uh, you're welcome, you get to hear him again. And if you haven't heard him, you're welcome, you get to hear him for the first time. And there's three stages of our life in Christ. There's justification, there's sanctification, and there's glorification. And again, like I said, we're good about justification and we're good about glorification, but where we get really in, in, in deep and in trouble is sanctification. So what do we mean by these things? Justification is that one-time deliverance that God does for us in Christ, the moment you surrender your life to him, because this is what Jesus says, come and lose your life for me. Come and die to yourself for me and know that the exchange is going to be, it's going to blow your mind because he's taking that which is wretched and giving you that which is righteous. You are immediately free in Christ from the penalty of sin. Legally, God declares you righteous. Even though it's not a righteousness of our own, it's called an alien righteousness. It's a gift of God because you and I don't have a righteousness that we could ever produce on our own. So the moment you accept Christ, I don't know when it was for you. It could have been elementary school. could have been high school. could have been two weeks ago. The moment you surrender, you give up, you submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ, that is the moment you are justified and you are immediately free from the penalty of sin and nothing ever again could be held against you because who could bring a charge against God's elect? No one. Woo! So now, what? What's next? Sanctification. This is the 40-year journey. It's not the one-night deliverance. We are now free as children of God in Christ from the power of sin. Even though sin raises its ugly head and says, I'm still going to beat you. I'm still going to conquer you. I'm still going to destroy you. We sit there in Christ and go, no, you're not. Why? Because greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world. The problem is we don't know how to avail ourselves to the power of God that gives us the power over sin. Here's the problem. It's not that you can't. Oftentimes it's that we won't. This is the process of discipleship. This is the process of saying, 
I am now empowered by God in Christ, given his spirit to say yes to God and no to sin. And you can't blame anyone but yourself because now your faith is attached to obedience and those two work together. Believer, if you're here this morning and you're in Christ, you have the power to say no to all the enemy's tactics and all of his methodology in trying to destroy you. And you don't have to be the person you used to be because you're a new creation in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. Hallelujah. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's, it's him who now lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who delivered himself and gave himself up for me. Galatians 2.20, 2 Corinthians 5.17. So this is where we're at. Because one day we're anticipating our glorification, the day that we will be free from the presence of sin, and that is not in this world. This is when we transition from this world to our eternal home. The place where there will be the lamb at the center of it all, the Father who says to us, well done, good and faithful servant. And it's a place that there will be no more disease, no more sin, no more death, no more de decay, no more rottenness, no more wickedness. But that's coming. But what about the existence now we have between the two poles of justification and glorification? It's called sanctification. And this is what we get to talk about today. So these next three points of remembering is going to help you in your sanctification. See, they're delivered from Egypt. Now what? God has rescued them because a lamb has been sacrificed in their place. And now as God is going to take them on a journey to the land flowing with milk and honey, what's next? Ladies and gentlemen, three things that I hope and I pray will inspire us in our journey in Christ. Because he gets the glory and we, for some reason, get to receive the good. And all of God's people said, Amen. Let's look at these three, three things. So point number two, we're going to start by saying, looking at remembering your deliverance. This is why the Jews were called to celebrate Passover. Because the Passover they just experienced was only symbolic. It delivered them from slavery in Egypt, but the Passover didn't deliver them from the slavery to sin. Do you understand that? Just because they put blood of the lamb on their doorpost doesn't mean they knew God. They were just obeying what God had said. So they experienced a physical deliverance. They didn't necessarily experience a spiritual deliverance. The reason God says, now I want you to remember what I've done by having a yearly celebration and remembrance of this is because you're never to forget what I've done because it pointed to a greater reality. The symbols pass over. The reality is Jesus. Write that down in your notes. Jesus is the reality. He's the yes and amen of all God's promises. Every ceremony, every festival in the scripture points to Christ. Those are merely shadows and types. And so when we remember our deliverance, we remember it by celebrating communion. Right? We celebrate the, the body given, the blood shed, that, the, that the, the elements are merely symbols pointing to the reality. The reality is 2,000 years ago, there was this God man named Jesus who died for us. He didn't deserve it. We did, but he took it for us. Hallelujah. And so we are to remember our deliverance. Last week, we saw this in Passover. And, and what the deliverance reminds us of, the reason we do, do not ever forget about the cross of Christ is because just like in this passage we're going to read here in, in, in um, Exodus 13, our lives are to be ordered and informed by God's deliverance. You are to look at every aspect of your life through the lens of God delivering you. And the moment you don't, you will destroy your life. This is how much the cross means. The cross is not just an add-on. You know, you don't get this package called life, and then God comes along and says, would you like to do an add-on to your life and just kind of throw this little module on the side and just kind of have it? No, no, no. The cross becomes your life. Redemption becomes your life. And any area of our life that does not fall under seeing it through the lens of redemption is doomed for failure. Meaning, I see my marriage through the cross. 
I see my finances through the cross. I see how I lead my life as a businessman through the cross. I look at my friendships through the cross. Not one area of my life is untouched by the deliverance God has given me in Jesus Christ. And if it is, it will be destroyed. Whoa. Some of you are like, that's intense. Yeah. So was going to the cross and dying for your sins. This is what, what Moses wants us to understand. Look at Exodus 13. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, consecrate, sanctify, set apart to me every firstborn, the first offspring of every womb among the sons of Israel, both of man and beast, because they belong to me. <laughs> so, so, God's, God's, uh, can we say he's showing his riz at, the, at this moment? No, no. Is that, no? Okay, we won't say that. Retract. <laughs> God is the same. I've done this for you. There is nothing you possess that isn't mine. Verse 2, 3. And Moses said to the people, Notice Moses doesn't like fight back. He's fought for God for so fought against God for so long. He's learned to submit. He goes to the people, remember this day. There's the word, right? Remember this day in which you went out from Egypt from the house of slavery, for by a powerful hand the Lord brought you out of this place, and nothing leavened shall be eaten. Do not forget what God has done. This has nothing to do with you. It wasn't, it wasn't even me, Moses says, right? It wasn't my you know, uh, ability to strategize a, a great mission to get you out of Egypt. It wasn't my, my wisdom. It wasn't my eloquence, obviously, right? We know that from his past banterings. It wasn't even the ingenuity of the people of Israel. It was God's powerful hand. You can take no credit for your salvation, church. It's all God, none of you, right? The moment you start to insert you into the equation, God does not get the glory, so on this day in the month of Abib, you are about to go forth. So again, they haven't even entered the journey yet. God is just setting up the saying, you want to be successful, quote unquote. Let me tell you what needs to happen. And it shall be when the Lord brings you to the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Termite, the Hevite, the Jebusites, the Mosquito Bites, you know, all those guys that were out there, so... He swore, the land that he swore to give to you, the land flowing with milk and honey, that you should observe this right in this month. What is that right? Well, it goes back to the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread. What is unleavened bread? Just for reminder. Bread made without yeast, because the Bible says... In this celebration, yeast represents sin. And because you were in such a quick hurry to get out of Egypt, realizing that was nothing but bondage and, and death, you had to leave quickly. You did not have time. You cleaned your houses. You got rid of all the yeast. So therefore, remember, you are a delivered people to be a devoted people. I am a conquering God who commands a consecrated people. Sin should have no place in your life. This is what the Feast of Unleavened Bread se celebrates. And nothing leavened shall be seen among you. Notice this. Not only are you not to have it, you're not even to look at it. How many of us are that severe when it comes to our discipleship? And you shall tell your son... On that day, saying, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be a sign to you on your hand and as a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a powerful hand, the Lord brought you out of Egypt. Therefore, you shall keep this ordinance and at its appointed time from year to year. Never forget. Remember. Remember your deliverance. Remember your devotion. Now it came about that when the Lord brings you to the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers to give it to you, that you shall devote to the Lord the first offspring of every womb and the first offspring of every beast that you own and males that belong to the Lord and every firstborn offspring of a, of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. 
So the donkey needs a substitute. You know who else needs a substitute? Us. What is God saying here? You can figure it out. But if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. Because donkeys were considered unclean. And they were valuable because they were service animals. So if God says the same thing is true for you, you know, you're, you're a servant, but you're also unclean. You need to be redeemed, but you can't be redeemed yourself. You need someone to be redeemed for you. And it shall be when your son asks you in time, verse 14, saying, what is this? Then you shall say to him with a powerful hand, the Lord brought us up out of Egypt from the house of Saul. So this is two times now your kids are saying, dad, tell us about this. Mom, tell us about this. And it came about when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go that the Lord killed every firstborn of the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sacrificed to the Lord the males, the first offspring of every woman, every firstborn of my sons I redeem. So it shall serve as a sign on your hand and with the phylacteries on your forehead, for with a powerful hand the Lord brought us up out of Egypt. Now it came about when the Lord, uh, when the Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and they return to Egypt. Hence, God led the people around the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea, and the sons of Israel went up in uh, martial array from the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God shall surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones from here with you. And they set out from Succoth and camped in Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way, and a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they may travel by day and by night. And he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. That means for 40 years they had God's presence continually with them. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts. Heads up. That last little section, we're going to really unpack next week, verses 17 through 20. But we'll just touch on it a little bit this morning. So what do we see here? So we see here the first point, first point being this, that we are to remember our deliverance. And the deliverance is tied to the firstborn. You remember in Egypt, they lost their firstborn children, firstborn animals, but yet the people of Israel, in obeying God's command, they sacrificed the firstborn unblemished lamb to be their deliverance. But these, again, point to greater reality. There's things we need to think about, three things we need to think about concerning firstborn or first fruits. Number one, Jesus is the ultimate firstborn. See, we cannot get away from the reality that Jesus is the reality, right? Because Passover is merely symbolic. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is merely symbolic. The Festival of Lights, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, all those things that are mentioned in Scripture are merely pointers to the reality which is Christ. So what we have to understand is that Jesus is the ultimate firstborn. And what do I mean by that? Amazingly, in order to redeem us, God offered up his own firstborn son. God did not spare even his own son, but gave his son to die on our behalf. Now, here's the first question that you usually get from people who may be young in the faith is like, does that mean Jesus was created? No, no, no. Jesus is eternal, just like the Father and the Spirit are eternal. He is an uncreated being. But he did take on human flesh to identify with us in our weaknesses, to struggle in all our trials and temptations, yet he did it without sin. Hallelujah. But firstborn means not created. What firstborn means is preeminent. And the Bible continues to speak in the New Testament about Jesus being firstborn. It says that Jesus was the firstborn of Mary in Matthew 1, Luke 2. Jesus was the firstborn from the dead, Colossians 1, Revelation 1. He's the firstborn among many brethren, Romans chapter 8. Jesus is the firstborn over all creation, Colossians 1. He is the firstborn who is returning, Hebrews chapter 1. And all who are in Christ are firstborn in him who is the ultimate firstborn. So what does this mean? It means exactly what God just did to all the Egyptian gods. There are gods, little g, that exist in our world, and we've made them into politics and Wall Street and sex and you name it, but there's only one God, capital G, who reigns over all, and he's made himself known in the personal work of Christ who is the ultimate firstborn. 
So lest we forget in our remembrance, we no longer belong to ourselves. We now belong to God because what did God give us? His own son. And this is the thing I think about when we think about our journey with with Christ, how much I am willing to withhold forgetting what God has given to me. And he didn't even keep his own son, but he gave him for me. Does Does your mind comprehend this? Is your heart just bursting with joy that God shows his love towards us and he demonstrates his love towards us that while we're yet sinners, Christ dies for us? Believer, if you truly understand the magnitude of the gospel and what God has done for you through his son, you will not hold anything back for him. This explains why even Mary and Joseph in Luke chapter 2, write it down, look at it later, They even take the baby Jesus to Jerusalem because Jesus is the firstborn in their family. And they, being a devoted Jewish couple, go and become a part of this rite of redemption. So it's a little bit crazy to think about. They're carrying the Lamb of God, their firstborn, and they're redeeming Jesus in the temple to be set apart. And he's ultimately going to be the deliverer even of Joseph and Mary, the parents themselves. My brain hurts. Okay, we'll move on. Jesus didn't need to be redeemed. Of course, that's not what this is saying. But it was necessary for him to fulfill all righteousness. So his parents kept the right of redemption. Which then means, point number two, the church is the unconditional firstborn. (laughs) Hebrews chapter 12. I don't know if you've noticed this verse. Sometimes there's these little verses that just like, wait, what did he just say? Look at Hebrews 12, verse 23. And to the assembly of the firstborn, who is that? The church. Who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. You and I, in Christ, are now the firstborn of God. And you know what this tells me? This tells me, like, okay, because of my union with Christ, I am now set apart unto him. I'm a new creature. We're a kingdom of priests. We've been bought by the blood of the lamb. Jesus is the firstborn and he is the first fruits, but because we've been redeemed by him, we are now united to him and now we share in the benefits and blessings of the firstborn of God. And so, so now we're part of this assembly of the firstborn and unless we get too prideful about this, that's why I added the word unconditional. Because here's my lovingly response to you, why should God ever set his affection upon you? You know, some of us walk around like, yep, God saved me. God chose me. Check me out. How quickly God was telling Israel, (laughs) don't become so prideful as if you were deserving of me loving you. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Right out of the gate, here's what God says to, to, to Israel. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. (laughs) So I love this. It's like God is like, he's going to pop their balloons of joy. He's going to rain on their parade. He's like, just so you know why I chose you, it's not because you were bigger than anybody else because we knew you were the smallest. But it was because the Lord loves you And is keeping an oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. You can lean on nothing, Israel. You can lean on nothing, church. You're only here because God chose you to be here. And you know what that just says to me in my response to that? Is because I am undeserving and his love is unconditional, why would I hold anything back from him? Which leads to point number three. Possessions are the unselfish first fruits of our lives. Meaning, write these three things down, time, treasure, talents. Everything that is given to you by God, you are not the owner of, you're a manager of. And here's what God wants from every single one of us. The first first fruits of your time, first fruits of your 
treasure, first fruits of your talent. Translated means the moment I get paid is the moment I set money aside for the Lord. Because I would not have the job if it wasn't for his good grace. I wouldn't have the capability to do my job if it wasn't for his good grace. I set aside my time. First, first moment of the, of the day is I'm going to get my heart right with the Lord. Because you know what happens? You don't get your heart right with the Lord at the beginning of the day. At the end of the day, you don't have time or energy left. Can I get an amen from all the moms and dads out there? Serving? Oh, I love serving myself, but when it comes to serving God and his purposes, I don't have anything left. This is why God says, what you have of everything that I've been given to, that's been given to you by him is to be a first fruit. Where do we get this from? Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. The, this is the wisdom literature. Solomon's writing to his son saying, this is how life is to be lived. And when you live according to this way, you're going to realize, man, there are blessings for obedience and there's curses for disobedience. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Now notice what it's not saying. It's not saying you do give these things to the Lord so that you, you have vats bursting and barns filled. He's saying when you obey me, you're going to be taken care of. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to who continue with, to withhold time, treasure, and tra- talents from the Lord. And they wonder why they're barns aren't full and their vats aren't bursting. I don't know what that looks like today, but it's kind of scary to think about, isn't it? I mean, think about this, you guys. Say I have a female acquaintance that I've known and I go, you know what? It's Christmas. I want to buy her something just, and I go out and I find this really rare Louis Vuitton handbag and I drop a thousand dollars because I appreciate the friendship. And then I go, you know what? I'm on my way home, and I haven't gotten anything for my wife. There's a Walmart, and I know they have a clearance rack, and I'm sure I can find something fun for her. And so I go, and I'm like, can you tell me where the clearance rack of women's handbags are? And the clerk says, oh, they're right over here. And I go, perfect. This one's on sale for $5.99. Honey, Merry Christmas, look what I got you. You think the Morgan household is going to be one of peace and comfort and love that night? Not for for me. When she goes, you spent how much on that person and you stopped to get me this? Is that not how we treat the Lord? I mean, let's be honest, people. I do this, you do this. We take care of all of our other little relationships, but the one relationship that matters, we give chump change to. It doesn't belong to you to begin with. This is why the Lord says, I command you to bring to me these things. He doesn't say donate. Donate's a wicked word. Right? Like you say, hey, Pastor Scott, uh, I'm really in a bind right now. Um, Can I borrow your car? Because I got to get to a job interview and this. And I go, sure, you can borrow my car. Now, when I ask for my car back, I'm not asking you. You're not donating it back to me. I call you and go, hey, heads up. When are you going to bring my car back to me? See, you're not treating it as a donation. You know who owns the car. So we need to remember Even when we talk about donations, they're not donations. They're what rightfully belongs to the Lord our God. Can can I just say right now, in love, we can do better in three areas of time, treasure, talent. When are you giving your first fruits of time to the Lord? You have 24 hours in a day. You know what that means? 2.4 hours, if you're going to tithe, your time to the Lord. How was your 2.4 hours for the Lord used yesterday? Some of you are like, 2.4 hours? I didn't even have 2.4 minutes. Did you tithe 10% to the Lord of your time yesterday? Some of you are going, now you're getting legalistic. No, I'm not. I'm motivating you out of love because I'm reminding you of what's ultimately important. Things have got a hold of our hearts, and those things often aren't the Spirit of God. This is called encouragement and admonishment all rolled up to one package. 
Ministry is free. Uh, salvation is free, but ministry costs. You know what? Met with the finance team yesterday. Even though we are short, just not a lot, but we're short this year for giving, we came out of that meeting laughing and smiling. You know why? Because our joy is not in how faithful or unfaithful people give. Our, our faith is in, in the Lord that provides for everything. But part of it comes to motivating and encouraging and reminding. Remember what God has done for you. Don't forget to reflect that joy to him. I got, we got paid on Friday. You know what the first thing I did? I opened up the Church Center app and said, all right, church, here's what, then you have to think about it. Even though I'm going, mm, man, we got that bill. We got, we got a daughter in college. We got two kids in private school. <laughs> I've got hot. For this. Think about it. Time, treasure, talent. Time, treasure, talent. Redeem the time for your Lord. Redeem your money for the Lord. I can go on and on and on. We don't want to play this game. You do? Okay. Later. Later. You need to stop and go, have I given anything to the Lord? Because I need to get more consistent. Have I even given anything at all? Because you need to start. I, I'm not a pastor that's afraid to talk about money. And it's interesting that Jesus talks about, mo about money more than any other topic. Because where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. And a lot of you, you say your heart's with Jesus, but your spending reflects otherwise. We talked in our finance meeting about the future. Talking about perhaps God has us on the cusp of a season of getting ready to maybe to do something with the socio missio model someplace else. The question is, are we even ready? Have we even casted vision? See, God will provide for his work to be done, but oftentimes it requires leaders to remind us of how those vision, that vision is accomplished. Salvation is free, but ministry costs. Salvation is free, but church planning costs. <laughs> See, we, God needs to do something here before we even think about doing something there. So, th so hear what I'm saying. If you're not giving, you need to start giving. Because you need to consider what God has done for you. And as God has provided for you, he is, he, he's able to withdraw, withdraw from you. That which you lean on. So we need to take inventory and say, well, how have I not honored God in these things? Not only that, but the time. Boy, how much we just blitz through social media and fill our minds with all the senseless stuff out there. And then we go, oh, yeah, I should maybe read the Bible once in a while. You think? Maybe I should serve God versus my. His kingdom is the kingdom that matters. Why are you serving your own kingdom? It's going to fall apart, guys. We're reminded of this continuously. Give to the Lord your first fruits. Honor him with your time, treasure, talents. And just watch what he'll do. He rewards the faithful. He rewards the obedient. Don't hear what I'm not saying. He's not a dollar for dollar kind of rewarding God. But he is the God who says, I will bless your life in more ways you could ever dream or imagine. Honor me with the first fruits of your life. Point number two, um, I won't get as preachy as I did. And there's no more finger snapping, unless you guys want to do that in between services. And then the second service is going to look at you guys like, what are you, drunk or what? Uh, remember your devotion. Um, we can't miss this, that God's calling us to a life of godliness. And he says this really in verses 3 through 10 with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. What you do with your freedom in Christ is, is huge. There was a British author named Charles Kingsley who said this, there are two freedoms, the false where a man is free to do what he likes and the true where a man is free to do as he ought. 
Too many people go, I'm saved, I'm good, I'll live my life however I want. Nope, that's not freedom in Christ. Freedom in Christ is now a devotion to say, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's not my kingdom I live for, it's his kingdom. There's four things. Let's write these down real quick. You are to be devoted to four things that I see woven in and out of this passage in Exodus 13. You're to be devoted to sanctification. Let's just throw them all up there. We're going to be devoted to service. We're going to be devoted to scripture. We're going to be devoted to sharing. So if you, if you look at this with me, the mark of maturity for any one of us is not that freedom is this toy to play with. Freedom is a tool to build with. This is what God is setting up Israel for. This is why he's saying, remember what I've done. Remember my powerful hand. Remember who you used to be. Remember where you came from. Now consider where you're at. Everything you used to be and where you came out of is to now act as a controlling influence of who you now are and where you're now at because of God's powerful hand. The fact of my salvation in Christ is the, is the controlling influence on everything I do. I don't just remember once a month when we do communion. I don't just remember once a week when we come to church together. I allow the gospel to be the controlling influence of my life, and this is why God commands it. Because he doesn't say, hey, Israel, now that you're out of Egypt, here's what I want you to do. Continually look back on who you used to be. Continue to look back on, on the horrible treatment you guys used to endure. You know what God says? He says, you are to move out in freedom with gratefulness and obedience because I have a greater future for you than the enemy had a past for you. And the thing with milk and honey, prosperity, is you think it's about what you can get from God when in reality true maturity in sanctification is this, getting God, having God himself. You think it was about the land of milk and honey? No. You know why it took Israel 40 years? It should have been a three-day journey. But it took 40 years. Why? Because God was continually working on their hearts. It's not the land. It's me you need. It's not the milk and honey. As much as that sounds amazing, it's me you want. It's me you need. So let me ask you. You're looking back on your, your past too often. You're forgetting what God has, has done to, to, to save you and sanctify you. He has set you apart. You're not the person you used to be. Praise God for that. He's going to do a new work in you. Are you ready for that? What does Paul say in Philippians chapter 3? Amazing passage. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do forgetting what lies behind Egypt <laughs> and straining forward to what lies ahead, meaning there's an eagerness for what's future, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is, this is what, what is motivating Paul. He's saying, now that God has delivered me, I want my heart to be devoted to him. Notice the order of events. God doesn't demand devotion until he first performs deliverance. Don't we get the order confused in our lives? We want to be devoted and then hope God delivers. God's already delivered you in Christ. Now live devoted for him. So devoted to sanctification. Sanctification means there's no longer in my life this division of secular and sacred. All you have and all you do is sacred. Haven't we done a disservice to the church by saying, here's spiritual holy things, here's non-spiritual unholy things. Whatever you do, whatever you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. You know who said that? It wasn't Mother Teresa, it was the Apostle Paul. Amen? We are to see everything as sacred. In Christ, we now belong to God. Romans chapter 6. I'm going to give you several verses. Write these down. These are good. Do, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? X, Facebook, Republican Party, Democratic Party, uh, um, EOS, uh, EOS, Jim, you can tell I go there a lot. I, I can't even pronounce it. What, why are you laughing? Why are you laughing? <laughs> you submit yourselves to somebody. 
And many of you say, I submit myself to Jesus. Do you? Because you become a slave. You obey either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart of the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Now you are slaves to righteousness. We are still servants, but we are the free servants of the living God. 1 Corinthians 6, a great verse that's often taken out of context. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? That's why, Pastor, you shouldn't be eating a pint and Jerry's every night. You can't tell me that verse and, and, and judge me on my, my ice cream eating habits, which is my spiritual gift. In context, this is sexuality. Do you not know the Lord has saved you, so conduct yourself sexually in a manner that glorifies God? Sex is God's idea. It's an amazing idea, but when there are no boundaries on our sex, it becomes a mess. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You have been bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Are we... In as radical in our devotion as we ought to be. Right? I mean, notice the verse 7. I mentioned, you are not even to have leaven. You're not even to look at it. How severe are we in saying, this is not good for my life in Christ. This is not good for my walk of Christ. And yet we continue to keep around like a little pet. We name our sins, we pet our sins, we justify their existence when we should be severing them severely out of our lives. What is there in your life that's keeping you from walking with the Lord? What is demanding obedience from you that is taking away from your obedience to Christ? Here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Don't keep it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. If God did not spare his, even his, his own son, what are you willing to sacrifice to him to love him with your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Number two, devoted to service. You've been saved for a purpose, and that's to serve the King of kings, the Lord of lords. This is what Paul talks about in, in Romans 12. Great passage, right? Brothers, Sisters, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Does he have all of you? Right? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. I mean, he's just saying to the church, I, I played games too with God. It's not worth it. I went through a lot of just religious activity, and I thought I was in, and I wasn't. God doesn't want all your activity. He wants your affections. He wants your service. Because there's nothing that reflects the heart of Jesus more than serving other people. He is the one who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. You think you're off the hook for serving people? Consider others' needs as more important than yourselves. Philippians chapter 2. Consider others as more important than yourself. And serve them. And don't quibble over, who's my neighbor? Everyone you meet is deserving of your service. Amen. Kindness is a powerful evangelistic tool in our world today. Number three, devoted to Scripture. Isn't it interesting where he says, hey, write these things on your on your, on, your, on your arms and on your mind, right? And the Jews took this literally, and they came up with these things called phylacteries. Davey, you know what a phylactery is? No? The boxes that they wear. What's in the box? Scripture. You ever seen super Orthodox Jews walk around with these boxes tied to their arms and boxes to their heads? And you're like, what are they doing, right? Like, is this a new Google uh, invention to... You know, make checkout at the ca cafe, that much easier. You know, look down, scan out, right, whatever. No, inside the box is a little tiny scroll. And scripture's on that scroll. 
And more often than not, it's the Shema of Israel that's written on that scroll, scroll uh, Deuteronomy 6.4. But this is not what God wanted them to do. Right? We're, we're good about carrying God's word around with us on our heads and on our arms and under our, under our arms. And, but you know where we don't carry the word of God? In our hearts. This is why Jesus condemned the Pharisees in Matthew 25 and said, you know what you guys do? You build bigger and bigger phylacteries on your head, like walking around like, check me out, bro. And God goes, that's not what I'm impressed by. I'm impressed by when you carry around the word on your hearts. Look at the words of Proverbs 6. My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always and tie them around your neck. Wait, wait, wait. I thought it was just heads and arms. No one said anything about necks because this is not what God's talking about in a literal figurative way. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will talk to you. For the commandment is a lamp and a teaching, a light, and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. Is that not good? Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, write God's word on your heart. Memorize scripture. Anyone can pull out the latest Taylor Swift lyric like that. Not that I would want to, but then maybe that's your thing. But I'm prone to turn on any, like, Journey song, and all of a sudden it's like, I know the lyrics. The wheel in the sky keeps on turning. Come on, let's go. I'm dating myself. But how many of us are quick with the word and just as easily it is to hear an 80s, 90s song to go, here's what the word says. Write it on your hearts. Because here's what's going to happen. When you set your life aside and you're serving the Lord and you're memorizing scripture and you're, your mind and your heart is saturated with what God wants you to understand. And isn't it interesting that mind affects how you behave and how you speak and arm implies how you work, right? This is what God wants to do. He wants to influence your thinking. He wants to influence your speech. He wants to influence your belief and your behaviors. He wants to influence your work. Your kids are going to notice something. So when your son asks you, Dad, Mom, tell us about that thing that happened. How God rescued you from the, the Pharaoh and from the land of Egypt. Be ready to tell them. Devoted to sharing. My, my uh, niece got married a couple weeks ago. You guys kind of heard a little bit about that. But what was cool is the reception for the wedding was at the church where God saved me as a 15-year-old. And then at age 18, I was baptized at that church. And where we had the wedding reception was in the room where there used to be a baptismal. And I couldn't wait to be like, go into the building and say, guys, 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 right there in that corner. There used to be a baptismal. And I was baptized in August of 1985. And they're looking at me going, okay. <laughs> I hadn't been back to that building since. It's a long time, but I remember. And that memory is connected to something God had done. And I was like so excited about what God had done, I wanted to share it with my kids. And how I want God, as we're a set-apart people, for our kids to go, Mom, Dad, why are we different than my, my na our neighborhood kids? Why are you different than some of your friends? Right? What sets you apart that your kids are going, tell us? And you're saying, well, number one, the reason we're different is because the Lord has shown us grace and mercy. The reason we're different is because the Lord Jesus has saved your mom and dad. And we will continue to live sharing that testimony because there's nothing more important than that. My kids get tired of me driving around saying, you know what happened over there? And you know what happened here? You know why? Those are the stones of remembrance where I remember God's faithfulness. If I become faithful, uh, uh, forgetful, I forget God's faithfulness. I become a miserly, miserable person. But when I remember the goodness of God, and I share it with my kids, I want them to taste and see that the Lord is good as much as I've tasted and seen that he's good. Do you want this for your kids? Do you want this for your kids' kids? Do you want this for kids that are not even your kids because you have a heart that says, I want all people to come to know Lord Jesus Christ. 
Psalm 78 says this. We will not hide them from their, our children, but tell them to the coming generation because the gospel is only one generation from extinction. The glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He's established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children. And then it continues on the next slide, so that they should set their hope in God. Our kids are hopeful people. Our problem as parents is sometimes we help them set their hope in things that are not secure. And not forget the works of God, but to keep his commandments, that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn, rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. Ladies and gentlemen, moms and dads, parents to all, because it takes a village, we can do better. Your heart has been wired by God for relationship. We tend to be finding our relationships in all the wrong places. I, I, I heard a story this, this week. You know what AI stands for? Not anymore. Seriously. As quickly as we're like, oh, I'm, I heard about this AI thing. You know what? It's changed. You know what it stands for now? Artificial intimacy. Right. Write it down. All the apps, all the chat bots, that are now feeding us information, counselors, romantic connections, companionship, all the things, it's now turning against us and people are continuing to spiral in loneliness, depression, and disconnectedness. And the newest thing that's talked about just this week is artificial intimacy. And we're dying because we're leaning on things that were never meant to give us intimacy and we're forgetting about the one who does. You think my kids aren't wired for intimacy? You think my kids aren't looking for connection through some of these means? And if I fail as a parent to remind them, get off your phone, <laughs> get off the computer, turn off the TV, and spend some time with your God. they will spiral into a life of self-destruction and misery. But it's not just my kids. Can I just say it's all of us in this room who try to look for the quick and easiest and cheapest, most accessible thing, and it doesn't exist. You know what does exist? Christ, the reality. That you were wired for him. And life cannot be found apart from him. So in artificial intelligence has led us to artificial intimacy, which will ultimately lead us to a real damnation. Hallelujah. What a savior. Praise God. He just reminds us, even today, Come to me, all you who are weary, heavy burden, lonely, discouraged. I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There's freedom in Christ. But nothing else. There's only freedom in Christ. May we find our hope and freedom and our everything in Him. Teaser next week, point number four. Remember your direction. So we're just gonna stop. And this week you guys can go, oh, where's he gonna go with this? Fill in, fill in some imaginary blanks. But I think this topic alone, God's presence in the fire and the cloud. How does God direct our lives today? 
By what means has he made his presence known? How do we know if we're on the right path? How does he direct our steps? How do we would know to t- how do we know to take the next step? Where do we take the next step? How do we take the next step? We're going to tease this out in one message because I think this is so good and so valuable. Love you guys. Praying for you guys. Excited for what God's doing. As much as this world kind of heaps despair and loneliness and depression upon us, our hope is complete in Christ. Therefore, our hearts can be full with joy knowing that our hope is in him because greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world. Amen, church? Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for deliverance. Thank you for doing for us what we can never do for ourselves. Thank you that you didn't even spare your son, but you gave him up for us all. What an amazing gift. Thank you for giving us that which we don't deserve. And so now may our response, may our reaction, may our May our resolution, our resolve today be, I'm going to serve you with 100% with all my mind, heart, strength, soul, spirit, everything. Lord, you, you deserve it all and more. I pray that we're not motivated by legalism, but we're motivated by love. I pray that we would continue to treasure Christ, never forgetting what he's done for us. And as a response of reflecting on that, great event in which we were saved. We live lives that are for your glory and our good. So Lord, thank you for your your presence. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy, which is new every single day. Help us. Help us to point others to the feast that is found at the table of the Lamb. Help us to show others where, where love and joy and forgiveness can be found. Lord, thank you for our time together today, for your church that you continue to build, working us and through us for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Love you guys. See you soon.